Hello, my name is Mr. Asprey and this is Edexcel International GCSE Paper 1H from Summer 2022. I'm going to be doing lots and lots of past paper videos over this exam period. I'm also going to be doing a series whereby I go through every single IGCSE topic that you need to know and I'm also going to be making little top tips as I go along as well. So if you are uh, doing this course, I do highly recommend that you subscribe to my channel and also if you could uh, like this video, that would be much appreciated. Okay, so without more ado, let's get on to the maths. Okay, pass the formula sheet and on to question number one. And it's talking about an arithmetic sequence and we need to work out the nth term. So my technique for this is to look at the difference between each of the terms. And in this case, we are adding four each time, which means it's very similar to the four times table or four times the position number. But it's slightly different and we can find what we need to add on or subtract by looking at the zeroth term. So let's imagine if I took this sequence back, five, one, the next term backwards would be minus three. So that's the zeroth term. And that just goes right here. So our answer is 4n minus 3. It says the nth term of another arithmetic sequence is 3n plus 5. Find an expression in terms of n for the 2nth term of this sequence. Well, whenever we have a certain term in the sequence, whether it be the nth term or the, in this case, 2nth term, then all we do is we replace the position number with whatever number we're looking for, or in this case, 2m. So we write 3, open brackets, 2m plus 5, and this can be simplified to 6m plus 5. So that is our formula. Great. Question number 2. It says the table gives the probabilities that when the spinner is spun once, it will land on 1 or it will land on 3. The probability of it landing on 2 is equal to the probability that it will land on 4, which means that we could write x in here and x in here because they're the same. Now, what we know about a probability tree like this, or sorry, not a tree, a table, is that it has to land on either 1, 2, 3, or 4. So when I add up these probabilities, they must add up to one whole, because it's certain that it's going to land on one of these. So that equals 1. Simplifying, I get 2x, and 0 0.26 plus 0 0.18 is 0 0.44. Subtracting that 0 0.144 to both sides gives me 2x is equal to 1 minus 0 0.44, which is 0 0.56. And then dividing through is going to give me 0 0.28. Okay, so that's really helpful. I can replace these now with 0 0.28. Okay, so we are told now that they work out an estimate for the number of times that the spinner will land on 3 is 45. And 3 has this amount of probability. So 0 0.18 probability gives 45 times landing. And it asks us then to work out how many times it will land on 4, which has a probability of 0 0.28. Well, we can use the, the unitary method here. And if we divide through by 18, then this is going to tell us how much 0 0.01 worth of probability will give us. So if I do 45 divided by 18, I get 2.5. And then I can work out how much 0 0.28, which is what we need, how much that gives us. And to do that, I'd multiply this by 28. So I have to multiply this by 28. So I take my 2.5 and I times it by 28 and I get 70. And that is our final answer. OK, 
Okay, highest common factor. The easiest way of doing this is to split up your numbers into prime factors. So I can divide this by 2, which gives me 28, which is the same as uh, 7 multiplied by 4, which is 2 and 2. So therefore we can say that 56 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 7. Let's do the same for 84. That's 2 times uh, 42, which is um, that's 7 times 6, which is 2 times 3. doesn't matter which order you do your splitting up. You'll always come to the same answer. So 2 times 2 times 3 times 7. We could draw a quick Venn diagram to find out all the factors they have in common. They both share a 2. They both share another 2. And they both share a 7. So those are the ones that are going to go in the middle. And to find the highest common factor, I just need to multiply all of the middle numbers together. So 2 times 2 times 7, which is 4 times 7, which is 28. OK, I'm going to do the same for this one. Slightly different, working out the lowest common multiple, but the same start. 2 and 30, 2 and 15. Always circle my primes. And then 3 and 5 like that, which gives us 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. 72 is 2 times 36, which is 2 times 18, which is um, 2 times 9, and 3 and 3. OK, quick Venn diagram. Now, which ones do they share? Also, I should have written this out. 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3. So they share a 2. That goes in the middle. They share another 2. So that goes in the middle. And they share a 3. So that goes in the middle. And then the left one has a 5. And the right one has a 2 and a 3. And the lowest common multiple are all of the numbers inside the Venn diagram times together. So I start with the middle and then the ones on the left, and then the ones on the right. So we have 2 times 2 times 3 times 5 times 2 times 3, and this gives us 360. Question 4. We have three regular polygons. So a polygon is regular if all sides are the same and all angles are the same. A, B, and C meeting at point. Polygon B has n sides. Work out the value of n. So what do we know about uh, meeting at a point? We know a point um, is, a, is, a, is a circle, essentially, and it must add up to 360 degrees. So I can write that 7x plus 3x plus 8x is equal to 360 degrees. This gives me 18x is equal to 360, so x is equal to 360 over 18, which is equal to 20. So the angle, the polygon we're interested in is polygon B, which is 7x. So we do 7 times x, which is 20, is 140. So the interior angle is equal to 740. So the exterior angle is always 180 minus the interior. Because if I were to draw a polygon like such, it would have an interior angle here, and then this would be the exterior angle, and they add up to 180 because they're on a straight line. So the exterior angle is 180 minus 140, which is equal to 40. Now, if I were to draw a polygon like such, that would go round, we'd have an exterior angle here, we'd have an exterior angle here, and in fact the exterior angles would go all the way around the shape. So the sum of the exterior angles is always equal to 360. So how many are there? Well we know that each one is 40, so how many 40s can we fit into 360? Well, the answer to that is 360 divided by 40, 
and that gives us 9, which means there are 9 sides, well there are 9 angles, which means there must be 9 sides as well. So the answer to that question is 9. Question 5, expand and simplify. So multiply like this, I like to draw a little claw. I know some people might use the foil method, but I like to draw a little claw like this, and I go through the line. So n times n is n squared. n times 4 is plus 4n. Uh, and then minus 6 times n is minus 6n. And then minus 6 times 4 is minus 24. We can simplify the 2 in the middle because they're both um, n's. So we get n squared minus 2n minus 24. Solving this equation, I don't like having a fraction in an equation. I want to get rid of that as soon as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by 4. So this side by 4 and this side by 4. So the left side, I get 8x minus 12. And the right side, this times by 4 cancels with this divide by 4, which means I'm left with 3x minus 5. I don't need to multiply the denominator by 4 because that would essentially be us timesing it by 4 twice, which wouldn't be equal. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 3x from both sides, so that turns into a 5x, and that 3x on the right disappears. I'm then going to add 12 to both sides, which cancels the minus 12 there, and adding 12 to minus 5 gives you plus 7. I'm going to divide through by 5 to get what 1x is, and I'm going to leave it as a fraction, 5 over 7. Sorry, 7 over 5. Uh, the table gives information about the value of apartments in euros and the annual service charge. Okay, and then it says in 2021 the value of uh, Asher's apartment was uh, this amount. The value of Asher's apartment had increased by 4% uh, from its value in 2020. And then work out um, has they, have they changed bands. Okay, so the first thing, uh, when I see that it says increased by 4%, I'm going to work out what that multiplier is. So a multiplier can be calculated by starting with 100%, and then because we're increasing, I'm adding on 4, and then always dividing by 100. And if I do that on my calculator, it can tell me what the multiplier is, plus 4, and then divide that by 100, and it's 1.04. So that's the only uh, number I'm going to be using in my equation. Okay, now let's have a look at then what band um, Asher's apartment is in currently. So we can see that it must be in band B because it's between 6, and 7, uh, 600,000 and 700,000. So it's in band B in 2021. And let's find out where it was in 2020. So the old price, I'm going to call that um, OP, was then multiplied by 1.04, and that equaled the new price, which is 634400. So if I wanted to find the old price, I would need to reverse that process, which is dividing by the multiplier. A lot of students instead multiply it perhaps by 0 0.96. It's not correct. You need to reverse the process, and the process was to times it by 1.04. So now we're going to divide it by 1.04. And this is going to give me um, 610000, and that is in the same band. Okay, so the answer is has, well, the question is has the service charge changed bands? The answer is no comma, still in band B. Okay, Pam bought a boat, how lovely. In each year after Pam bought the boat, the value of the boat depreciated by 15%. Work out the total percentage by which the value of the boat had depreciated by the end of the second year after Pam bought the boat. So again, I'm going to look here at 
um, depreciated by 50%. Well, what's that multiplier? Well, I start with 100 always, and this time it's depreciating, so it's taking away 15% over 100. I go to my calculator, and I can do 100 minus 15 over 100, and the multiplier is 0 0.85. So whatever price Pam's boat was, let's call it X, it was multiplied by 0 0.85, and that's what happened after the first year. But I need to work out how much it's worth after the second year. So I need to multiply it by 0 0.85 again. Well, what do you get when you time something by 0 0.85 twice? Well, 0 0.85 times 0 0.85 is the same as timesing it by 0 0.7225. So this is 0 0.7225. Okay, so work out the total percentage by which the boat had depreciated. Well, the new boat is 72.25% worth of the old boat. So what's the difference? Well, we started with 100%. I need to subtract 72.25% and it's in fact lost 27.75%. Question 7. The force exerted by the cylinder on the ground is 72 newtons. Okay. And the pressure on the ground due to the cylinder is 1.4 newtons centimetres squared. So a quick check, we've got newtons and newtons, we've got centimetres and centimetres, so we don't need to do any conversion of units, that's helpful. So let's substitute into the formula which we're given then. So the pressure is 1.4, and that's equal to the force, which is 72, divided by the area. Okay, so it's this area that we don't know yet. We need to rearrange this formula. If I multiply both sides by the area, I'm going to get 1.4 times by the area is equal to 72. And then if I divide both sides by 1.4, I'm going to get the area is equal to 72 divided by 1.4. And we can put that into our calculator. 72 divided by 1.4. And that is, well, it's not pretty, so I'm just going to write that as 51.4. But I'm going to keep it in my calculator in case I need to use it again. Okay, so what we've actually been asked to work out is the volume of the cylinder. Now, we know from our formula booklet that the volume of the cylinder is the area, or the cross-sectional area, which you've just worked out, multiplied by the length, or the height in this case, or how far that area gets pushed through the shape to create a prism. So to work out the volume of this prism, I'm going to have to do the area multiplied by the height in this case. So I need to take this and times it by 18. And that's going to give me um, 925.71. But it's asking it to three significant figures, so that is equal to 9, 2, and the 7 will round up the 5 to a 6. And that will be centimetres cubed. Standard form, we need to figure out how many times this number has been divided by 10. So, if I want my uh, number to be in standard form, I have to write it with a number which is between 1 and 10. So, if I put a decimal point there, that's going to give me 8.9, which is perfect, because that's between 1 and 10. And then I've got to figure out how many times it was divided by. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And because we're dividing, we're timesing by 10 to the minus 5, all small numbers will be to the power of a negative number like such and now we're going to write this as an ordinary number so we're going to start with 8.34 and then we're going to multiply it by 10 four times so one two three four 
and we're going to put zeros in any gaps like that. So we're going to get 8, 3, 4, 0, 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. So this is just 8 times 1, which is 8. When I divide x's, I subtract the powers. So this becomes the powers become 6 minus minus 5 which is equal to 11 so we get x to the 11 so therefore p is 11 and when I have a bracket as such I must look at the number first and cube that which is going to give me 8 I then look at the uh, k value which is squared and then I cube that and when we have a bracket a power and then to the to the, another power on top of it we multiply those two numbers together so we get k to the 6 and then I look at the m and that needs to be cubed and again I've got a power to the power so we multiply those two numbers to get 12 so it's 8k to the 6 m to the 12 Okay, I uh, remember when this question, uh, I was surprised by it, but when we read into it a little bit more, hopefully we can solve it. So two circles are drawn on a centimetre grid with one centimetre for one unit on each axis. And the centre of circle C1 is at the point minus 1, 3. So if we just draw a quick sketch, sometimes it makes it easier. So minus 1, 3 is about there. And the centre 2 is at 718. So that's going to be like up in this direction somewhat. Um, and it tells us the radius as well. But it asks us to work out the distance between the centres first. So that's just this horizontal, or sorry, this diagonal line like this. And whenever we've got coordinates and we're trying to work out the distance between them, we can set up a right angle triangle like so. Um, yeah, like that. Okay, let's work out the distance of that x down the bottom. Uh, sorry, that red line down the bottom. So that goes from minus 1 on the x-axis all the way along to 7 on the x-axis. So that has a value of 8. So 8 goes there. And then what about the orange line? Well, that starts at the y position of 3, and it goes all the way up to the y position of 18. So that difference is 18 minus 3, which is 15. So by Pythagoras, we can work out the, um, the length of this uh, line here, the, the green line. So we will have 8 squared plus 15 squared. And if I want to work out what c squared is, well, that's going to equal 8 squared plus 15 squared. So c will equal the square root of let's go to our calculator uh, 8 squared plus 15 squared which is 289 so the square root of that is 17 okay part B we're asked to explain why circle C1 intersects circle C2 well we need to have a look at how far the circles reach out and that's going to give that's given by their radiuses. So, if I look at my uh, diagram again, and C one has a radius of thirteen, so that's going to be quite big, and um, C two has a radius of six. And if we look along this line here, this line is seventeen long, and if they weren't to intersect then the red and the orange line would have to be less in total than 17. But because 13 plus 6 is greater than 17, because 19 is greater than 17, uh, they must intersect. They must intersect. Okay, factorise. Now, on first glance, you might say these don't factorise because they don't share any number factors and they don't share any letter factors. The trick here is difference of two squares. 
And difference of two squares states that minus a squared, sorry, a squared minus b squared is equal to a minus b times a plus b. And these two terms are both squares and they're subtracted, so we can use this, this method. So I take the square root of 9x squared, which is just 3x, and I take the square root of 4y squared, which is just 2y, and I subtract them, and then I add them, and I have factorized. Um, an algebraic fraction, uh, whenever we're adding fractions, whether they're just normal or algebraic, we have to find a common denominator. So the common denominator between these two, or the lowest common denominator, would be 8x. So I need to convert them both into 8x. So this left one, I've got to multiply top and bottom by x, which is going to give me 7x on top. And this one over here, I've got to multiply top and bottom by 2, which is going to give me 2x plus 6 and 8x on the bottom. Now, whenever I'm subtracting fractions, there's a, there's a really common mistake which can happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in brackets, the numerators like that. And then I'm going to read across. So I've got 7x minus 2x. Well, that's straightforward. That's 5x. But then in terms of the numbers, I've got minus plus 6. So I've got to take away everything on that right-hand side fraction. So I've got to take away that positive 6. So it's minus 6 that goes here. And that's all over the common denominator of 8. OK, Rudolph goes to the gym. The probability that he uses the treadmill is 0 0.8. OK, great. That can go here. And the complement to 0 0.8 is 0 0.2 because they add to 1. When he uses the treadmill, okay, the top branch, the probability that he will use the cross trainer is 0 0.3. And therefore, the complement of that is 0 0.7, again, because they add to 1. And when he does not use the treadmill, the probability that he uses the cross trainer is 0 0.6. So that goes in there. And again, the complement of that is 0 0.4, because they add to 1. Work out the probability that he uses both the treadmill and cross trainer. Well, using both, I can only do that by going down this branch here. And to work out the probability of a branch, we multiply the probabilities together. So it's 0 0.8 times 0 0.3, which is 0 0.24. Okay, question 13. Anton is going on is, is going on holiday. He makes three separate payments. Okay, one, two, and three. Work out how much he has to pay for payment two. Well, we need to convert these so that they are in the same form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three apes and I'm going to write that as a percentage. So I can go to my calculator and write three apes, press equals, and then S to D, and that will give me the uh, decimal. So if I times it by 100, that will give me the percentage. S to D again, so that's 37.5. So that's 37.5%. So therefore, payment 1 and payment 2 is a total of 37.5% plus 45%. So what is that? If I add on 45%, I'm going to get a total of 82.5%. And this can then tell me what payment 3 is, in terms of percentage anyway. So obviously the total cost is going to add up to 100%. So if I do 100 minus that 82.5, I'm going to realize that payment free is 17.5%. And I know what payment free is. So 17.5% of the total is equal to $406. And what do I need to actually work out? I need to work out payment 2. I need to work out 45% of the total. I'm going to use the unitary method, and I'm going to work out what 1% is by dividing by 17.5 on both sides. So 1% of the total 
will give me 406 divided by 17.5 which is 23.2 and what do I need? I need 45% of the total so I'm going to multiply 1 by 45 and I have to multiply this by 45 as well so I'm going to get times by 45 one thousand and forty four dollars functions we have a function here and we've been asked to work out f of 10 and that means we substitute 10 into our function so f of 10 is equal to 2 times 10 over 10 minus 6 which is 20 over 4 which is 5 find the inverse function in the form of f to uh, f of to the minus 1 of x is equal to something okay how do we find the inverse function well first off what you do is you set y equal to your original function and then you do a switcheroo where you replace every y with an x and every x with a y. So I write x equals and then I write 2y over y minus 6. And then what I need to do is I need to make y the subject of that equation. So I don't like having a fraction, I don't like having a denominator there, I'm going to multiply it to the other side. Like so. I'm then going to expand the brackets. And then I need to collect all the y's on one side and all the terms without a y on the other. So I'm going to add the 6x to the other side. And then I'm going to subtract the 2y over to this side. Now the reason why I'm doing that is because whenever you have a, um, um, a formula you need to rearrange which has the subject appearing twice, you're going to have to move them all over to one side and then you're going to have to factorize. So factorizing the left hand side I could take out the y which leaves me with x minus 2. And the benefit of that is now y only appears once and we can divide through by that bracket to get 6x over x minus 2. So that's my answer, 6x over x minus 2. Okay, next question. Uh, Abraham is going to play a computer game. He can win the game, uh, draw the game, or lose the game. And this is the probability for each winning, drawing, and losing. And he gets 10 points, or 0 points, or minus 5, depending on what the outcome is. And he's going to play three games, and he's going to add up the scores of each game. And what's the probability that he will end up with 0 points? Okay, so zero points. So he could either, we've got to figure out all the possibilities. So he could either win, we'll give him 10, and then lose, lose, we'll put him back to zero. Or in fact, just one win and two losses will be enough. So he could either lose, win, lose, or he could lose, lose, and then clutch out on the final game to get the win. So those are three different ways, but there's also um, an, another way. He could uh, be super boring and end up drawing all three of his games, and that will keep him on zero. And I think that's, they're the only ways that he could end up with zero after, after he's finished. So how do we work out these probabilities? Well, it's like a tree diagram. We need to multiply along in order to get our outcome for each one. So a win followed by a loss. Um, is 0 0.2 times by 0 0.2 and we can write it out like this and in fact these are going to be exactly the same value so we only need to do it once because um, we're going to get 0 0.3 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 and that's going to be the same as all the other three which is going to be 0 0.012 
and how do we draw? Well, draw is 0 0.5, so it's just 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, which is the same as uh, 0.5 um, cubed, essentially. Uh, whoops, no, I was trying to be too fancy there. 0 0.5 cubed, which is 0 0.125. Okay, and as always, we add up all of our different combinations, all of the possibilities. So it's 0 0.125 plus 3 times 0 0.012, which gives us 0 0.161. Okay, question 16. Without using a calculator show that this is equal to this. Well, let's start by looking at this. 12 uh, root 2 minus 1. If I want to rationalize a, um, a denominator, I need to multiply it by the same third, but with the sign in the middle changed. So in this case, root 2 plus 1. Okay, so the top becomes 12 lots of root 2 plus 1 and the bottom becomes root 2 minus 1 root 2 plus 1. Multiplying out the brackets on top I get 12 lots of root 2 plus 12 and the brackets on the bottom root 2 times root 2 is 2 then you're going to get root 2 times 1 and you're going to get root 2 times minus 1 and then you're finally going to get minus 1 times 1, which is just minus 1. Okay, so what's going to happen on this denominator? We're going to have a plus root 2 minus a root 2. It's going to cancel out to 0. And then we're going to have 2 minus 1, which is just 1. And anything divided by 1 is just whatever it is on top. So this is going to simplify to 12 root 2 plus 12. And what have we got next? We've still got, we've just, we've just done this part brilliant, but we've still got this minus root 2 to the power 5. So that is minus root 2, root 2, root 2, root 2, a root 2. Okay, can we simplify that down? Well, yes, we can, because root 2 times root 2 is 2. And once again, root 2 times root 2 is 2. So this is the same as 2 times 2. And then we've still got this root 2 at the end. So we have, in total, four lots of root 2 to take away. And 12 lots of root 2 minus four lots of root 2 is eight lots of root 2. Oh, but we're not done. No, no, because we want it as a root 32. OK. Well, what is eight? We know that there is a 2 here. So let's take the 2 out, and what are we left with? We're left with 4 root 2. OK. And how can I write that as a single third? Well, 4 is the same as root 16. And when I have two thirds multiplied together like that, we could just multiply the two numbers and put it under a single square root. So 16 times 2 is 32. And now we have what we've been asked for. Lovely. OK, question number 17. We have a particle along a straight line and a fixed point O lies on this line. The displacement of P from O at time seconds T is, uh, is S meters and we have it given here. Now, whenever I see a question like this, I know I'm going to have to differentiate in order to find our velocity or acceleration, because displacement, velocity, acceleration, and if I differentiate down, I get the one after the other. Now, in order for me to differentiate this uh, S equation here, I need to write the Ts as powers so I can differentiate them, and one over T is the same as t to the minus 1. 
Okay, great. So if I were to differentiate this, I would get the velocity. And in fact, it asked me, it says the velocity of P um, at t seconds is V. And it says work out the distance of O from of P to O at the instant when the velocity is zero. Okay, so let's find the velocity then because that is the derivative of the displacement. And when I differentiate, I take the power and I multiply it by the coefficient, which is eight, and I drop the power down by one to one. But anything to the power one is just itself. And here I take the power and I times it by the coefficient. So that's going to give me minus 125. And then I drop the power down by one to get minus two. And I've been asked to analyze the point where the velocity is equal to zero. So I'm going to set that equal to zero. Now, whenever I have a, uh, a negative power of x or for t, for example, in my equation, the best way to remove that is to multiply both sides by the positive power. So in this case, t squared. So what will that give me? Well, times 8t by t squared gives me t cubed. And multiplying t squared by t to the minus 1, well, I add the powers together to get t to the 0, which is just 1. So I'm just left with 125. Uh, rearranging is going to give me this. Then I'm going to divide through by 8. And luckily, these are both cube numbers. So I know I'm onto a good thing here. Because when I cube root 1, 2, 5 over 8, I get 5 over 2. Great. So that's the time. But we're not asked for the time. We're actually asked for the distance. And luckily, we do have a formula for the distance or the displacement. Uh, and it's this. So I just need to sub my time back into this um, S formula here. So S is 4 multiplied by 5 over 2 squared plus 125 over 5 over 2. Okay, so to the calculator we go, we do 4 lots of 5 over 2 squared plus 125 over 5 over 2. And we get 75, which is a nice round number, so I feel like that is good. Okay, this is like a classic sine and cosine rule question. Now, how do you know when to use which? Well, you can only use the sine rule if you have a corresponding angle and side available to you. So for example, if I had this in here, this was 15, let's say, then I would have a angle and I would have a side opposite it. And having both of those two bits of information means I can use the sine rule. But I don't have that right now, so I'm going to have to use the cosine rule. So looking at the cosine rule, I have an angle, and the angle opposite, the side opposite is the side which we need to use for the cosine rule, and I need to have um, the other two sides as well in order to use it. So the cosine rule states that the uh, side opposite the angle, squared, is equal to the other two sides, squared, added together, minus two lots of the other two sides times together times by cosine of that angle opposite the side we're trying to find. Okay, so to the calculator, 9.7 squared plus 12.3 squared minus two times 9.7 times 12.3 times cosine of 115. Okay, so we write y squared is equal to 3, 4, 6, dot, dot, dot. And then we write y is equal to the square root of that. And that is going to give me the square root of 3, 4, uh, sorry, best thing to do is just do square root of previous answer. And that is 18.6. Okay, so now we have that. We now have a, uh, a pair. We have a pair of 
a side and its opposite angle and that means that we can use the sine rule now which is going to be very helpful because x is pointing to a side which we know. So the sine rule uh, for angles I will start by writing the sine of x on top over its opposite side 9.7 is equal to sine of 115 over its opposite side 18.6. Rearranging by multiplying that 9.7 up to the other side gives me sine of 115 over 18.6 multiplied by 9.7. So to go to the calculator we would press um, sine and um, we press sine of 115 now I've still got my last answer which was that 18.6 in my calculator so I'm going to press answer rather than rounding and I'm going to write 9.7 there that gives me 0 0.47 so I'll write that down just so the examiner knows that I know what I'm doing 0 0.47 and then to work out x I would need to do sine to the minus 1 of that value. So I just go shift sine of my previous answer equals 28.2 is to three significant figures. Question 19, we have a sector of a circle we have a center 0 and radius r plus 7 and the angle is 45 degrees. Um, a circle has radius r minus 2 and the area of the sector is twice the area of the circle. Okay, so let's first, out, let's first off work out what the area of the sector would be. Um, so area of um, S is equal to, um, so f it's, a, it's a circle but it's only 45 out of 360 degrees. So I multiply that by the area of a circle which is pi times by the radius in this case which is r plus 7 squared. So that's the area of the um, uh, uh, sector. The area of the circle C, well that's a bit more straightforward, it's just pi multiplied by the radius which is r minus 2 all squared. Now it says that the area of the sector is twice the area of the circle. Now a lot of students get this wrong when we uh, we have a, a statement like this. If the area of the circle is twice the area, the area of the sector is twice the area of the circle, then I have to multiply the area of the circle by two in order to make them equal. Because the circle is the smaller one, so I need to multiply that by two in order to make them equal. So we write out our equation like this. Okay, so we need to do um, some uh, cancelling. The first thing we can spot here is that pi can be divided from both sides. I can multiply both sides by, um, or as, sorry, actually first I, I can rewrite 45 over 360. That will make it much easier because that is the same as 1 eighth. So I can write that as 1 eighth. And then I can multiply both sides by uh, 8 which is going to give me r plus 7 all squared is equal to 16 lots of r minus 2 all squared. And then I need to expand the brackets. Uh, a double bracket like this, I would write like r plus 7, r plus 7. And that will give me r squared, it will give me 7r, and another 7r makes 14r. And then 7 times 7 is 49. And that's equal to 16, and then r minus 2, r minus 2. So that's going to give me r squared. I'm going to get a minus 2r and another minus 2r, so minus 4r. And I'm going to get minus 2 times minus 2, which is plus 4. Okay, so let's keep at it. And let's write this as 16r squared. 16 times 4 is 64. And 16 times 4 again is 64. 
Okay, so the right hand side is the more has the bigger R squared, so I'm going to move everything to that side so that my R squared is positive. So subtracting an R squared is going to give me 15. Um, subtracting 14 is going to give me minus 78. And subtracting 49 is going to give me 15. Okay, now when I have a quadratic like this with not particularly pleasant numbers, I need to think, is there anything I can divide through by? Well, I've actually spotted that these are all multiples of 3. So I can divide through by 3. And this will give me 5r squared minus... Um, divide that by 3 is 26r plus 5 equals 0. And then I'm going to show you how I factorize quadratics like this. I look at the a and the c term, and I multiply those two together. So 5 times 5 is 25. I then look at the b term, which is minus 26. And I find two numbers that add to make minus 26, and times together to, make my, uh, together to get 25, which is minus 1 and minus 25. I then write 5r in both brackets, and then I write all over 5, and that's all because this number here is 5. Each of these 5s represent that number there. Minus 1 and minus 25 go in the brackets, and I can divide the right bracket there by 5, so I get 5r minus 1, and I get r minus 5. So therefore r is equal to 1 over 5, and r is equal to 5. Now the question is, do we need to eliminate one of these answers? Well, yes we do, because of this bit here. r minus 2 is a distance. But can r minus 2 be a distance if we select r to be 1 over 5? Because that would give me r minus 2 would be 1 over 5 minus 2, and that will be less than 0. And we can't have a distance which is less than 0. So therefore we have to eliminate this as one of the solutions, and the only solution is that r equals 5. Right, we've got some, glass, we've got some classic graph transformations here. We have uh, s and t, and the um, coordinates of the maximum point are given as s and t, and then we've got f of x minus 2. Now what does this mean? This means to the right by 2. So that means the x coordinate is going to change by 2, so we're going to add on 2, so it's going to be s plus 2. And what does this one mean here? f of x, f of 3x, this is a stretch upwards by a scale factor of 3. So the y is going to stretch up 3 times, so it's going to be 3t. Okay, histograms. If I'm being honest, histograms are my least favourite topic of the whole GCSE. But here we go. There are no children for whom m is greater than 100. Yep, that makes sense. There's nothing uh, to the right of 100. And there are 10 children for whom m is less than or equal to 20, which means this area here has an area, a frequency of 10. So from there, we can actually ascertain what the frequency density is. Because the area of that block is 10, the width is 20, so 20 times the height will give me 10. So therefore the height of that block is 10 over 20, which is 0 0.5. So that's 0 0.5, which means that's 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4, and 4.5. Okay, estimate, uh, work out an estimate for the number of children whom are between... 50 and 80. 
Okay, so let's look at that particular block. Then what blocks are we looking at? So if I draw a line down here, halfway between 40 and 60, so this green block will be from 50 to 60, which we need to include. And we also want to go all the way up to 80. So we're going to have to include the whole of this block. That needs to be included. And we also need to include this block here up until 80. So the question is, work out the area of those three blocks and add them together. So the green block has a width down the bottom of 10. And it has a height all the way up to 2.9, um, that looks like. So that's 29. And the red has a width up, uh, it goes to 75, so from 60 it's 15. And the height goes up to 3.2. Okay, so 15 times uh, 3.2 is 48. And then the last one has a width of 5, so it starts at 75 and goes to 80, and it has a height of 2. So that's nice and easy, 10. Okay, let's add them up, and that should give us the number of children we're looking for. And that is going to be a 7, carry the 1, and that is 6, 7, 8, so 87. Question 22, we've got a cone and a hemisphere, and it says that the circular plane face of the hemisphere, because, yeah, blah, 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 the radius of the hemisphere and the radius of the circular face are both 20, the curved surface area of the cone is 580 pi, and the volume of the solid is uh, k pi, so find k. So find the volume of the solid, basically. Okay, the curved surface area. Now, the curved surface area of, your, uh, of a cone is given in your formula booklet to equal um, pi r l, where l is the slanted height of the cone. So we're told that 5, 8, 580 pi is equal to pi r, which is 20, times l, which we don't know yet. But we can work l out by dividing through by 20 pi. So 580 pi over 20 pi is going to give us, um, it's going to give us 29. Okay, so 29 is the, is, the, is the slanted height. Now, if I were to draw this cone out like this, um, in order for me to work out the volume of it, I need to work out the height of the cone. So the height of the cone would go from the center of the circle right up to the top of the, um, the top of the cone. We know this value down the bottom would be the radius, which we know is 20. And we now also know that the slanted height is 29. So we can use Pythagoras to work out the height. So we know that height squared plus 20 squared, the two short sides, must equal the hypotenuse squared. So the height is equal to the square root of 29 squared minus 20 squared. So we can go to our calculator and we could do square root of 29 squared minus 20 squared. Whoops, making a bit of hash of this. 21, perfect. And now we can work out the volume of these two uh, shapes. So let's start off with the cone. Um, the, co the volume of the cone, again, it's given in your formula booklet. It's a one third of the of pi multiplied by the uh, radius squared times by the height so in this case it's one third pi times 20 squared multiplied by the height which is 21 so we can do one third uh, i'm going to leave out the pi because uh, it's just going to get things messy, and we don't need to use it in our final answer. Uh, so we get 2,800. Okay, great. So that's 2,800. But that's just the cone. 
We also need this uh, hemisphere, which has a radius of 20. So that was the radius of the cone. The radius of the hemisphere, uh, sorry, the volume of the hemisphere is, it's a hemisphere, so it has to be half of the total sphere, which is 4 thirds multiplied by pi times by r cubed. And again, the sphere is given in your formula booklet. Um, so this is going to give me, um, well, we can go straight to our calculator for this, um, 1 half multiplied by 4 over 3. Again, I'm going to leave out the pi, and r cubed is 20 cubed, which is 16 thousand over 3 pi. So the total volume are these two things added together. So 16,000 over 3 plus 2,800 gives you 24400 over 3. And that's times by pi. So therefore they wanted it in terms of k pi. Um, and it wants the exact value of k. So we can't write it as a decimal. We have to leave it as a fraction. And that is 24400 over 3. Okay, this is um, Edexcel's attempt at trying to scare everyone by combining two topics um, and asking it in a way where it's not clear how to start. So let me try and explain it the best I can. Um, it says that a polygon has n sides where n is greater than 5. When arranging in size order, starting with the largest number, the interior angles of a polygon um, form an arithmetic sequence. And here are the first five terms. Find the value of n out of nowhere. It's like, how on earth do you get started? Well, what do we know first about arithmetic sequences? We know the sum of an arithmetic sequence. So we can start with that, because the sum of an arithmetic sequence, as given in your formula booklet, is the number of terms divided by 2, multiplied by 2a plus n minus 1d. And what also do we know about the sum of interior angles? Well, we know that the sum of the interior angles of any polygon is given as n minus 2 multiplied by 180. So this sequence is an arithmetic sequence and therefore it will have a sum like this. But it's also representing a, um, a polygon which we know when we add up all these angles will add up to make n minus 2 times 180. So these two things are going to be the same. Okay, now we've got an equation, and when we have an equation, we can solve it. So what do we know? Let's start. So n over 2. Um, 2a is 2 times the first term, which is 77. So it's 2 times, sorry, 177, which is 354. Um, the difference is how much the sequence is changing, which is minus 2 each time. So we have here n times minus 2, so that's minus 2n. And we also have minus 1 times minus 2, which is plus 2. And that's equal to, expanding these brackets out, 180n minus 360. OK, I'm going to multiply this bracket, and everything needs to be multiplied by n, and then divided by 2 as well. So I'm going to get... Um, well, we know that uh, 357 divided by 2 is 177 times n. We're going to get a, an n squared, because we're dividing that by 2 times to get by n. And we're going to get 1 times by n, it's just n. And that's equal to 180n minus 360. Uh, so this is 178n minus n squared is equal to 180n minus 360. I'm going to move everything over to the right in order to make the n squared positive. And taking away 178n from 180 gives me plus 2n. And we've got this minus 360 here. Now factorising, I need to find two numbers which add to make 2 
and times together to make um, 360 or minus 360. So those numbers are, well, there have to be two numbers that are very close to each other. So I'm thinking uh, minus 20, uh, no, plus 20 and minus 18 should do the job. Yep, that works. So plus 20 and minus 18. And this is going to give us n is equal to 18. The other one will be a negative answer, which it can't be, of course, because n represents the number of sides of a polygon. So n equals 18 is the final answer. And we are on to question number 24, the final question on the paper. Okay, um, we've got a quadratic in terms of um, Q, and we have uh, something that can be written in terms of A, B, and C. So perhaps the easiest thing to do here is to expand this one and then compare how it looks once it's been expanded. Because uh, it's much easier to expand than it is to uh, complete the square. So let's start off with this part first, x minus c squared. That's the same, of course, as x minus c, x minus c, which is x squared minus an xc minus another xc, so minus 2 xc, uh, or perhaps I'll write cx because x is actually the variable and c is just a constant, and then minus c times minus c is plus c squared. Okay, um, so now if I do a minus b lots of what I've just worked out, then that's the same as a minus b multiplied by x squared minus 2xc plus c squared. So this is going to give me a, and I'm going to get a minus bx squared. I'm going to get a plus, because two minuses, and a 2bcx, and I'm going to get a minus bc squared. Okay, great. So let's write all of the terms which has no x in it first. So an a minus b c squared. The term which has just an x and then the term that has just x squared. And let's compare that then to q plus 12x minus qx squared. Okay, so now we have the constants, we have the x's, and we have the x squareds. And these should all line up perfectly. So straight away I can see that b must equal q from the green box. So b must equal q. Um, and then from the blue box, that tells me that 2bc must equal 12. I know that b is q already, so 2qc must equal 12. So c must equal uh, 12 divided by 2q, which is the same as 6 divided by q. So c is 6 over q. And then finally I can look at the yellow box, and that tells me that a minus b c squared is the same as q. Um, we know that a minus b is q and c squared is going to be 36 over q squared. So if I square that fraction of c, I square the numerator and the denominator, so I get 36 over q squared and that's equal to q. Okay, so we get a, let's simplify this, because we've got q times by something over q squared, so we can cancel out q and cancel out the squared on the bottom. So this is just minus 36 over q. And then add that to the other side, I get a is equal to q plus 36 over q. And I think that is good. And we're done.
Hi, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was useful. I've got much more content coming your way. I'm going to be going through every single IGCSE topic with exam questions, common mistakes and top tips. I've also got previous year's exam papers you can watch here. I've also got a series where I look at the hardest uh, IGCSE questions. And finally, if you were to subscribe, that would be very much appreciated. And please do like this video. Thanks very much. Good luck with your exams and bye for now.